The Magnificent Seven on 107.3 HFM. This is the show that takes you behind the scenes in the wonderful world of the creative arts. Hosted by a team of creative artists and arts administrators, The Magnificent Seven introduces you to guests from all aspects of the creative arts. Dance, film, music, photography, theatre, visual arts and writing. Only on 107.3 HFM, Tuesdays between 7 and 9pm, this is the voice of your community. is indeed the voice of your community 107.3 HFM you're here with James and Kay tonight on the Hello. Magnificent Seven yeah this is our first trip back in the new year isn't it? I believe so happy yeah. new year Kay I know happy new year James and happy new year to our lovely guest Jane yes. how are you doing tonight Jane good good happy new year to you both seems like a long time ago now <laughs> it does, it doesn't just, it yes yeah. I was saying to Kay I think it was last week that Australia seems to shut between sort of late December and about now hmm now you've got all these public holidays, then it goes to Australia Day, or the, um, however we're going to more politically correctly um, pronounce that day, and then it starts again now. So um, hopefully the year will begin to pick up from now, be dreadfully successful for everybody, mm. including you and your new enterprise, which we're going to talk about presently. Yes, we okay. should go to a song first, though. Uh, we're going to um, do The Sound of Sunshine. This is... Of particular, why did you choose this one, Jane? We'll do your intro in a minute. Oh, because it's incredibly happy and I love it. Oh, well, <laughs> that was the same reason why I decided to put it first, actually. <laughs> okay, so this is by Michael Fronty and Spearhead, if I can read that correctly. One, two, three, uh-huh.
the sun goes, that's the sound. Fabulous. It was a great song, yes. Yeah, it makes you want to dance, doesn't it? Doesn't it, yes. You, you, yeah, we sometimes do <laughs> <laughs> around the around the station. <laughs> so, Jane Hammond, you are the a filmmaker and you're the director and producer of uh, Black to- Cockatoo Crisis, which is how I came to know you. I was doing some web surfing and came across the movie and the Black Cockatoos are very near and dear to my heart and I did not know how close they were to extinction. So, tell us a little bit about your how you came to, to get to this point and a little bit about yourself. Yeah. No pressure look, at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> look, I, I, think th- I think that's one of the reasons for the film is that people don't realise we're seeing these endangered species on a regular basis and because we see them, we think, well, they can't be endangered. There's no problem there. She'll be right. And they can be annoying, right? Like all d- oh. endearing things. Like not, James is endearing to and me. he's annoying. Not to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, these cockatoos are just gorgeous they are um uh you know like they can rip anything i plan to part or they can do whatever they like like they they, they are faultless in, in my eyes you know after a year of filming them and following them around i am totally and utterly in love mm-hmm. with these gorgeous gorgeous creatures and in particular the carnabies but uh look so which one specifically are the carnabies the carnabies are white tails okay um and they're the more common there's yep. two white tails in western australia the Bodans, okay. yep, Bodans. Yep. There's mm-hmm. so many ways to say that word. Mm-hmm. Um, Bodans, um, and uh, there's about four thousand of those left. And Carnabies is about forty thousand. That's but not many, is it? Is no. Anything? Well, well, forty thousand sounds like a lot, but because these birds are so independent, interdependent on one another, they need groups. They need social interaction, uh, and they need the transfer of knowledge. So we don't really know how many. Um, you know, what the tipping point to a population crash is. Yeah, yeah. Tell me more about the transfer of knowledge. What's, oh, look, that? these birds are communicating absolutely constantly and, and watching them, you can... I, I picked up some of their language, I guess, you know, like mm-hmm. um, from other people who were watching them but also just observation, like, come on, let's go now, is a different sort of a, a sound to, um, you know, oh, what's who's uh, in trouble or is it my turn, whatever, I don't know. You see the way they socially organise um, and how they can come together in a place they weren't the night before mm. uh, en masse. Um, and I've seen them at the Mega Roost, uh, and they, uh, which is in the Nangara Pines. I've seen 3,000 birds come together. Um, there wow. were more than that, but uh, last year there were about 3,000 come together. And the cacophony that, that, um, that results from that as they're just all talking at once. That must be so loud. It, it's incredible. I, I opened the film with a, a scene from that. Just I had my Canon camera on the ground just shooting up. There's no, you can't see any movement, but you can just hear the, just the cacophony. And I was waiting for it to sort of die down, but it didn't. And we had to go in the end, into, out of the dark and tick-infested forest. <laughs> <laughs> we had to crunch our way out. Wow. But um, well, we, we have a friend who um, has a, a support bird, a blue macaw, who can actually notify her if um, she's starting to go into distress or her heart's not you know, doing the things it's meant to be doing. And she takes it night clubbing. And I said, what about the noise? And she just laughed at me. She said, if you've ever heard these birds in the wild, you'd understand that's a ridiculous question. Mm, and that's mm. exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, I, I, but definitely these birds are, they belong in the wild, mm. it, you know, definitely. And they belong with one another. Um, to see them in a cage is, is, is absolutely heartbreaking. You know, so, um, some birds ha- can never be released. Cause, uh, but, yeah, as pets, I, I'm totally against that. Not, not that I'm criticising yeah. the woman with the macaw, um, but, um, yeah, these birds will outlive us. Um, so they live to about 50 or 60, don't they? Yeah, or 70 in really? captivity. So if, wow. you, if you take on one of these birds, you need to have a, Long-term a plan. plan as to who's going to look after it when you go. And they... And they you know, attach themselves to people. It's tragic. 
yeah, but I don't, don't get me down that path. Um, so look, I'm very much in in the field of um, these birds belong in the wild. Let's protect their habitat. Is what what I'm sort of really keen to do. We yeah. have a friend down at uh, Red Zoo who uh, Red from Red Zoo, and he's got a I think it is a carnaby, isn't it? Because mm. it's got the white tail. Yeah, he's a conservation centre as well, so yeah. I imagine that came from, as you say, one that uh, can't live in the wild anymore, which yeah, is a possibly. shame. Yeah, possibly, yeah. But mm. it's a lovely bird, you can approach it, you, you need to be a little bit careful because it's not that sociable, but uh, it's, it's, you know, it's lovely, and, and they're, they're really quite magnificent when you get close to them, aren't they? Mm. Oh, they, they are a very beautiful, beautiful bird, all three species of mm -hmm. black cockatoo, and they're much bigger than you think, Yes. you know, when you get up close, yeah. um, but, you know, having watched them for so long, they're different personalities, even their faces look different, mm. you know, they don't, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't, I would have laughed at that a little while ago, but, you know, they're, they're, there's so much character in these birds, so much individual um, individualness and people yeah. who see them regularly Uniqueness. you know yep. sometimes give sometimes give them names like there's one that um, uh, one of the um, people who puts out water regularly for the birds uh, named uh, Baldy because he's sort of <laughs> missing a few feathers so he's yeah. Baldy and, and Baldy's growing back his feathers this year so um, you know there are you you can tell them apart um, at um, for close and in a closer way as well yeah. Um, so yeah, that's probably somebody congratulating you for being on air. So we'll uh, give oh, you I'll put it on airplane mode. Sorry about that. <laughs> so do um, you, do you find that the uh, given that you you have um, reinforced uh, the knowledge that um, these birds are becoming more and more uh, rare, do you find that that is now being recognised in the uh, corridors of power where they've actually got the wherewithal to do something about it and to to restrict the amount of encroachment on the territories? Well, it's early days yet. We're still working on that. Okay. Really, right at the moment, it's getting the film out, getting the narrative, building that narrative. We're getting heaps of media. Um, this, this is also really helping, you know, talking on the radio. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, regional tours, um, getting, yeah, a lot of interest out there. So this takes a while. I mean, my last film was Cry of the Forest. Yep. And, um, and we campaigned really hard on that, and it took the government at least eight months before they... Um, they did a momentous thing and stopped logging. Um, okay. So, so with these sorts of things, you've got to give the government a bit of time and give the people time to go meet with their pollies and start that pressure. But we have had MPs come to the film. Just in Margaret River, we had Jane Kelsby, who's yep. the local Warren Blackwood member. Yep, yep. Um, she came to the film. She talked. She was, you know, like I love seeing politicians in, and we always give them a give them a, a plug no matter you know what party they're from or mm -hmm. or what they, they might have done before but yeah look good local members will, will listen to their people okay um, so it must have been quite difficult down in uh, margs where the where, where the timber industry is really um because it's a quite significant industry down there well the timber industry is, is um stays are up it's only got a year to go before lo all logging is banned so is that just native logging or uh, plantation logging as no well? no no plantation logging is is, is a good ahead. thing yeah, yeah, yeah. um uh, we have haven't got enough of it except it gets a bit nuanced here except yeah. when we go to the nangara pines this is what i was going to talk and, about and yeah we've got the nangara pines on the northern fringe of, of perth it used to be twenty eight thousand hectares of pines beautiful carnaby habitat was was chopped down all the banksias was taken out to put in a million you know zillions of pines but um in the 90s it was decided that these pines were going to go because they were taking too much water from the system and uh the government plans now to wipe out them all and the carnabies have become dependent on the remaining pines and if those pines are taken out and they're slated to all go within two weeks two to three years then our carnabies could pay, face starvation so so what did they um previously live on and before the pine well, went in that the that area was um rich bushland, banksia woodlands and yep. they love the banksias and they love the grubs and that that quondong quongong heath it's called um is perfect foraging grounds for carnabies um on the swan coastal plain so they feast up on these areas and then they head into the wheat belt to nest but, you know, they get to the wheat belt and there's been so much clearing, there's hardly any logs left. Mm. So at every point we're attacking our carnabies, uh, we're attacking our red tails in the forest and our bull dance. At every single point, there's just a, a million spot fires. 
yeah. it's not one thing it's it's uh multiple factors that are driving these birds to extinction yeah let's go to a song we'll come back there's more to talk about obviously um this is you are a plane tree is there a particular reason for it it's actually yeah, a very appropriate is, time for it this is the music of armenia and i came across this lucky oceans um used to have a radio program on on radio national and he described it many years ago as the most beautiful piece of music in the world and I agree, it absolutely is. And I know that's a really big call, but mm-hmm. check it out. Okay, we will indeed right now. a plumber? AHM Plumbing and Gas are a locally owned and operated company that will take care of all your plumbing needs, from tap servicing to hot water unit replacement or clearing block drains. AHM Plumbing and Gas have 30 plus years experience and will get the job done on time at the right price. Follow us on Facebook for monthly discounts and specials. Your local experts, AHM Plumbing and Gas, 0413 191 034, PL6754, station sponsor. Here's former Socceroos legend Tim Cale for Rad. What does it mean to be a designated driver? It means you're the friend who's agreed not to drink, not the person who's had the least to drink. It takes guts and shows you care about your friends. Face it, their lives are in your hands. So why don't you and your friends take it in turns to be the designated driver when you go out? You'll make the road a lot safer for all of us. In Armadale, Gosnells, Cannington and Serpentine Jarradale. 
We're the voice of your community. 107.3 HFM. And here with Jane Hammond and James and Kay on The Magnificent Seven, talking about the black cockatoos and their disappearing forests. Yeah. So, James, you had a question. You're burning with a question. I can see it. I actually forgot what I was going to say <laughs> uh, before the, the thing. But, um, we well, were, we're talking about the pine trees and how the pine yes. trees were going to go, and I think the next question was what could replace them yes. with something that's going to be suitable. It, you know, what, it, what is the plan for replacing those pine trees once they go, do you know? Yep, absolutely, there's no plan. The plan of the government... Oh, I'm shocked. ...right now <laughs> is to leave 28,000 hectares of former pine plantation to, uh, as fallow ground to weed uh, infested waste ground. For housing, I presume? No, nope. I mean, it's sort of in the future future, it may be housing, but there's a good 40 years before we'll get that far. Because this is this goes from Nangara right the way, Pinjar Pines and to Yanship Pines. So we've had this massive area um, that, you know, was a pine plantation that took away a natural bush, uh, that the that the birds, because they're incredibly adaptable, have learnt to eat the pine cones and rely on those pine cones, but those pines are dwindling. They're dwindling at an incredible rate and we've, we're have we down to less than 5,000 hectares now. And uh, So why wouldn't they be reforesting that area? Well, it's a water issue. They, t- they did some science that really needs to be reviewed and redone. Uh, in the 1990s, there was problems with the Nangara Mound and the, wa- the, wa- the pines were blamed uh, for uh, not allowing enough aquifer recharge. So they are catching the water before the, 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 the Nangara Mound could be recharged. But there was a lot of, there was a lot of um, finger pointing at the pines because it was sort of an obvious thing to, well, we'll just chop them and then we won't, notice how many people are illegally tapping into our, our, our water mounds um, and we won't, um, you know, won't, won't worry about all that other stuff. Um, meanwhile, we've built salination plants so the Nangara Mound is not as dependent, you know, it's not as crucial for Perth water as it was in the past and we need to be re-looking at the science and seeing, you know, this is a drying climate, that's its main problem, not, um, not so much the pines. But even if we just left those 5,000, Mm-hmm. If we left those 5,000 until we revegetated that area with Bankshire that once was there uh, and other foraging foods, I mean, that to me is a solution, just a, a, an absolute halt on any more cutting down of the pines. And the companies that are relying on that, there's a, a pine company out there, uh, they can get that material with a deal with the government from the southwest. Mm-hmm. And there are, there are pine plantations in the southwest and the government has just invested another $350 million in the southwest into putting more pines in. It's land that they're lacking, not pines at the moment. That's my understanding. So we could we could rethink these things. It, we, we're talking about endangered species. So, um, you know, the government has been under pressure to do something about this and has been turning a blind eye. In fact, uh, Hugh Finn, who's a fa- fabulous, um, you know, a professor out at Curtin University and had done a lot of work with the cockatoos and is now a lawyer, he put an application to the EPA um, saying that this was, there was an endangered species there and this is actually a changing land use. And the EPA um, was, supposed to, was supposed to report within 28 days, was supposed to answer that question, um, as to whether they would reassess. Now, they shelved that for six months. That, that was done in June and it was a week before Christmas when everyone's distracted that they said, oh, we'll give you six and a half days to come up with a public submission. So well, come on, everybody, if you're really interested, you know, but everyone's doing their Christmas shopping or the tuned out, but still they got, they got their, um, they got a response. So now, be, uh, you know, they're stalling it so long, the pines will be gone before they make a decision. You know, we, our way, EPA... Do you, think that, do you think that's being done deliberately? Oh, I, I look, I think it's understaffed, but I think our EPA is not servicing our environment, it's not serving the environment, it's not serving the people. It's, it's, it literally is every project approved. That's okay. what everyone calls it, EPA. That's what it stands for, not environmental protection. So we need a radical resh- reshape of this body that's supposed to look after endangered species. So is the, um, the EPA um, a... Um an organisation that's um, got cronyism going on, has attached to cronyism, you know, I, ma- mates of mates sort I, of thing. I have no idea. I mean, I, I, I don't know what their thinking is. I know there were problems in the past, but I thought they put a broom through some of the, you know, the, 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 the um, board members that had 
shares. I, I don't know. I, th- I think it's a matter of um, uh, understaffing um, and, um, you know, a ticket There's a lot, lots of factors, of course. Yeah. And probably a lot that we don't know as well. Yeah. Um, would the best thing for the, the birds be to keep the pines long term or to reforest so they can readapt to their natural habitat again? Like what's, or is it a combination of both, ideally? I, th- I think it's a combination of both. I mean, I think we need to. Um, we need to keep the pines now until we find another solution. We find because we clearly have a re- reforestation expertise in Australia. I mean, the, the mine mining companies are doing it all the time, reforesting very, very well. And CSI, not CSI, um, where Trevor works. Kings Park. Yeah, Research Kings Park people. has um, amazing, you know, knowledge uh, and experience yeah, around reforesting. We know what to do. We right. know how to do it. It's undoubted. But uh, we're just not. Um, and part of that is um, it, there was a plan to revegetate a lot of that area, mm-hmm. um, but then COVID happened. And, right. and for okay. some reason, even though the birds don't get COVID, <laughs> um, that They've was shelved. It was still it. an excuse. So, uh, you know, the government really has to look at this and they have to look at it fast before we lose more and more of these birds. Because if, if these birds that are so dependent and we're looking at... I think it's 35% or something of the entire carnivore's population or you know, a large proportion of the, the, the Perth-based carnivores that, that come in and use the Swan Coastal Plain rely on those pines. So that's why we had the appearance in, uh, in the discovery of the mega roost, which is the most exciting discovery mm. of these birds using this one area. Um, but, you know... Uh, that itself is dwindling and if these birds don't get enough to feed enough food you know that they can't breed they can't go they won't have the energy to go out to the wheat belt the scientists say in the film they will most likely die so it, it's it's just a tragedy waiting to happen and and, and a shameful government inaction i'm so I want to get to more about the uh, how, what they like in the wheat belt and what they do out there, but let's do another song first. And this one, I think, is particularly of interest. This is from a band called Selby. Did I say that right? Yep, Selby. Yes. So it's, it's uh, spelt S-E-L-B-I-I for those people who want to look it up as soon as I start playing the song. A song called Daffodil, and why is this important? This is a local indie band uh, which features my son, Solomon, as drummer. Um, but these guys are really... Um, they've got a great sound, really gravelly, really original, um, and they've got a, a new release coming out on the 11th. Um. They've got a few songs, haven't they? I, I quite enjoyed this one. I had to listen to it all the way through, make sure there was no rude words or anything, and there wasn't. It was it was very lovely. Yeah. yeah. But they, they do have, is it half a dozen or so songs that they've got out? Yeah, a lot like of that? originals. Yeah. Okay, so this is Daffodils by Selby. Yes. 
Well, I hope they have tremendous success with that song. That's uh, that's a real cracker. Yeah, nicely that's lovely, done, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. We'll see if we can uh, stick it into the rotation here. We'll have a we'll have a quiet chat with Coops and ask him very nicely. Yeah. Uh, where were we? We were talking about um, how these birds impact um, uh, the, the wheat, the wheat belt, belt and that's right. orchards and um, some of the reasons why the birds are being um, negatively impacted out in the environment. I, I wanted to ask whether or not farmers find them a particular nuisance, whether that's a problem. Yeah, generally no in the wheat belt. Um, in fact, you know, there's a lot of effort that goes into um, looking after these birds and building nests and um, uh, protecting habitat. There's a, I mean, I, th- I think most people love these birds, but there are some old school farmers who will, you know, if it flies, they'll shoot it. You know, if it moves, they'll shoot it. But, uh, but I think is that because they feel they're a pest, or is that a sport, uh, or is I, 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 I don't know. I don't okay. know what the mind of somebody who shoots things is. But look, in in the orchards and nut farms. We have anecdotal evidence that our bodans are being shot out of the sky because they've got a rather a sort of a large beak and they go into apple and pears in particular and pluck out those delicious seeds because there's not much else left. And, you know, they're quite wasteful. Mm. Um, but orchardists have in the past um, treated them as a pest and we understand that the shooting is continuing because the bodies are being found occasionally and the injured birds are being found with horrific injuries and brought into places like Karakin. So we know that this is going on um, and our bodans are really, really on the brink. There's, well, we at best guess there's 4,000 of those left, but it could be half that or, or less. We just don't know. Just hypothetically, and you might not know the answer to this question, if I was to hear a farmer shooting a bird or happen to drive past and see it, who would I report? that to Oh, that'd be deep, the Department of Biodiversity and Conservation. Right. I mean, you, you, uh, Parks and Wildlife, If you, it's highly illegal to harm any endangered species. So I think it, the fines are like $10,000 or something. Um, I'm not really sure. But I think it's very hard to catch these people because they do it, you know, when no one's looking. Well, you think it'd be very hard to um, shoot something and not have anybody else in the neighbourhood hear it these days. Mm. You know, you'd have to have a yeah. pretty large orchard for nobody to hear that happening. Well, but people are shooting guns left, right and centre anyway. And they also mm-hmm. have bird scarers that sound very like guns. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if anybody asks, well, it's just my bird scarer or I'm just, you know, like I was filming one day and somebody let, let off right next door to where we were filming a gas cannon, which is just designed to scare birds. And the birds are do- doing nothing, just doing their thing. Mm. And, uh, you know, this constant harassment, this constant, um, um, you know, adrenaline rush from from loud noises is, is really not good for creatures. This, I was interviewing a doctor who was who was saying, you know, the central nervous system, you can't, it's really not a good thing to do to just keep, you know, um, firing gas cannons into the air to, to scare birds. But, it, but it ha- it's happened, it's the second time I've seen that when I've been filming. I was filming in suburbia and somebody did that. You know, people don't like, they don't, they don't like leaves falling off trees, they don't like cockatoos eating nuts, they don't, you know, some people... Well, I, I know this is a very serious topic, um, but uh, we used to have a couple of bin chickens, the ibis, used to, you know, make a mess with the dog food, and I used to go out there with one of those water guns, and they, it became a game, mm. <laughs> and they would, like, dance around the water until I could, like, get them, and they kind of gave up and went inside. Yeah, not the same as a gun cannon. No. I do have these images of little old Italian men now running orchards and firing Gas water cannons. pistols at the, the, the sky. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know that they're any ethnic <laughs> um, um, group. I think it's just uh, possibly old school, old school. Um, but, you know, I was talking to um, somebody in the east, on the East Coast who overheard a conversation recently. He's a, he works, this is um, a little 12-year-old boy called Spencer Hinchcliffe, and he, he, I was talking to his mum, he's coming to one of our screenings, um, he's working to save the, the um, black cockatoos at Noosa. Wow. Um, so there's people all over the country saving these birds. Um, and he was saying that, you know, it was a, um, his, his mum was there when they were listening to this conversation of, of two young people in their early 20s talking about shooting um, these endangered birds really? for a sport. Wow. And, that, and they were making that discussion in the coffee shop. You know, um, so uh, yeah, it's it's hard to fathom, but there are people who will shoot anything. You know, yes, indeed. Uh, Spirit Bird is a song by Xavier Rudd. Is this well? Kind of fits into your theme, doesn't it? Absolutely, it's a beautiful, beautiful song, and I'm such a Xavier Rudd fan. Oh, I see. Let's all become Xavier Rudd fans with this song.
the time and we wonder why Do what we can, laugh and we cry And we sleep in your dust because we've seen this all before Culture fades with tears and grace Leaving us stunned, hollow with shame We have seen this all, seen this all before Many tribes of a modern kind Doing brand new work Same spirit by side Joining hearts and hands In ancestral twine Ancestral twine Many tribes of a modern kind Doing brand new work Same spirit by side Joining hearts and hands In ancestral twine Ancestral twine Slowly it fades And slowly we fade And slowly you fade And slowly you fade Amen hey
laugh and we cry and we sleep in your dust because we And welcome back to 107.3 HFM, the voice of your community. This is James and Kay on uh, The Magnificent Seven this evening with our guest, Jane. How are you doing, Jane? And yeah, some good. magnificent music. It was. That was gorgeous. Um, so... Forging ahead with our uh, inquiries into the uh, the black cockatoos, um, what I wanted to really know was uh, what part in the environmental chain does the carnaby perform, and what happens if, as as you're saying, they're likely to disappear. Yeah, look, these birds, um, all th- all three species that we're talking about in the film um, of black cockatoo, play a really vital role in the forest ecosystem in uh, spreading seeds. Yep. So their actions, you know, they they eat the seeds and then you know poop obviously them. they poop yep. them out. Yep. Um, uh, but also keeping the forest healthy. You know, they they will strip a tree of bugs that are eating. A okay. tree, so they're keeping that forest, um, you know, really, really healthy, and you can see them sort of digging at bark and then popping out. So, are they bugs. insectivores or omnivores, or what are they? Yeah, they're well, they they eat a range of foods, especially the carnabies. Yeah, um, their beaks are uh, really, really strong, so yep. they can strip away things. Um, so they can eat, uh, you know, they they eat things off the ground. They eat things bugs in trees, they strip the middle of a Banksia cone and they get the, bro- the bug out for their protein. So they're really, really versatile um, yep. creatures. And if we save the carnabies, if we save the red tails and if we save the bodans, we save these umbrella species that are so visual yep. that we all love. You know, it's hard to find anywhere who doesn't love these black cockatoos, but there's a few, but mostly they don't. You know, mostly we, we all love them. Uh, then we also... They're umbrella species, so we protect all these other creatures that we might not, you know, that might not be so obvious. The yeah. little tiny orchids that you might stomp on by mistake, as rare as hen's teeth that they are, yeah, yeah. coming up out of the People keep finding ground. those, don't they? Absolutely, because they now start looking. Um, so if we if we look after the, this megafauna of the forest, we're also protecting the trees and the environment, the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, it... it the carnies are definitely part of the cycle and a, and a very crucial part. Okay. Fabulous. We should take a short break for a uh, service announcement. A Community. service announcement. Here Community. is one what I prepared earlier. Oh, good job, James. <laughs> uh, just breathe and get ready to feel alive at the sounds of Pearl Jam and Fleetwood Mac. These Perth bands even flow and landslide will rock Centennial Pioneer Park Amphitheatre at Gosnells with a Pearl Jam and Fleetwood Mac tribute concert on Saturday the 11th of February from 5.30 to 9pm. This is a licensed and ticketed event. Under 18s must be accompanied by an adult. You can get your tickets by going to www.gosnells.wa.gov.au and follow the prompts to book your ticket and find out more. That's the City of Armadale, I think, isn't it? Does it say uh, City of Armadale? It does not. That's gosnellswa.gov. So oh, the Gosnell, City of Gosnells. Okay. I think I recall the Deputy Mayor of Gosnells on here um, having a little bit of a go at Fleetwood Mac. So, yes. Well, clearly you she's not getting complimentary and, tickets. He, yeah, you yeah. should go and then go up to the Deputy Mayor and tell him that he might have been mistaken about it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's just run a couple of these and we will have more chatting with Jane shortly. In Thornley, Mount Nasura and Jarradale, we're the voice of your community. 107.3 HFM. Does your business have a good web presence? Are you missing business opportunities by having an outdated web page? Did you know there are six important tips to boost your web personality? Let station sponsor Antonovich Design build or update your web page. Your website will be custom designed to suit your needs working directly with our experienced designers. Get more leads and more conversions with a web page that is browser friendly and works on all devices. Call Antonovich Design on 0449 134 107.3 HFM, the voice of your community, is proudly supported by South Eastern Motor Trimmers WA Classic Sounds Canning Agricultural, Horticultural and Recreational Society Become a corporate member and support the voice of your community. Go to the webpage, heritagefm.org, for email details or to find out more. In Langford, Bedford Dale and Whitby, we're the voice of your community. 107.3 HFM. And welcome back to uh, Gossywood. Gossywood. Where, yes, yes, we've got a film coming up, of course, and as Jane's just telling us, there's been lots of filming done here already. 
So we can't call it the Gotham Getty anymore, James. It's now oh, Gotham Wood. This amuses me. <laughs> <laughs> So moving away from activism uh, and talking more about the practicality of filmmaking, uh, you've been working on environmental issues for a while. Can you tell us about a couple of the other films you've done and uh, maybe what the process is that you, you follow when you're working on these films? How do you get um, um, fired up to make a, want to make a film? Because it's a bit of a job, isn't it? Feel free to answer any one of those six questions. Yeah, uh, no, look. Uh, <laughs> whichever uh, order you like. Yeah, I, I was, I've been an environmental activist since I was 14, so that's quite a long time. Um, and then I was a journalist for many years. Uh, and in the process of, of, of my journalism, I came across a story about the Montara ore disaster off the West Australian coast, mm -hmm. which most people have never heard of or don't remember. It happened in 2009. I was a journalist at the West Australian when that happened, and I covered it as much as I could. But I knew there was something just that the story just wasn't getting what it deserved. The public relations companies were making an absolute mutza, selling uh, a line that all was well and it was just a technical issue, but the environment was missing out. And the people of West Timor, whose seaweed farms had been heavily impacted by this, this oil disaster, were just not... Their story was not being told. And so I thought, uh, I need to tell this story but I need to tell it in film and um, I, I want the people to speak for themselves you know through interpreters obviously and I didn't have the skills at the time um, to go up there with a camera um, so I thought uh, since a cinematographer costs a minimum of you know around a thousand dollars a day and I've got zippo money mm -hmm. then I'll need to go back to university learn how to be a filmmaker and go up to West Timor and tell this story. Wow. And so that's exactly what I did. I took redundancy from the West Australian in 2012. I started um, at uh, ECU um, and started uh, a, what became a Masters in, in Film um, and Video and finished in the WA Screen Academy. Um, and uh, in that process, while I was at university, I, I made my first... Uh, well, I made my two first... Two, two at the same time... Um, uh, longer form videos uh, of films. One was called uh, Crude Injustice mm -hmm. yep. um, and that was my sort of major project at uni um, and I, it had me going back as I thought to West Timor and following this story um, and uh, and then I also made A Fractured State which was a half hour film um, designed to tell the story of fracking in Western Australia and the threat. So um, I, was, I, I got some funding for fr A Fractured State was the fracking anti-fracking story because I was working for Lock the Gate as a campaigner the same time as at uni, um, and but um, with Crude Injustice, I I had a forty uh, uh, sorry in an hour long film that really needed cutting back. It was a bit rambling, and I showed it to Kathy Henkel at Screen Academy, and she said, "No, nah, you got to you got to get a proper editor to come and, and help you out here." Um, so she suggested a way I could apply for some funding, and I actually. Um, pitched the story and I got funding, a small amount, paid an editor and and then uh, cut that story in half um, and, and made it a lot flow a lot better and so that became A Crude Injustice, mm. which um, actually came out then after A Fractured State. Um, and so those two, you know, I learned a lot in the process of doing that. I, I learned about community and... Um, how to campaign with a film, which I now have taken that on. But um, but with a, a crude injustice, I didn't have a campaign behind me. It was sort of a bit of a solo af affair, and so everybody I knew uh, saw the film. Um, you know, people, well, old school friends to people I met down the library. You know, everybody <laughs> came, <laughs> but it, it just wasn't enough. But that that um, it helped lift the story. It helped, um, and since then, there's been a huge legal battle a 300 million dollar class action uh the comp it's still going on that the the sea seaweed farmers won the case but uh of course the greedy company uh, appealed and now they have to go back to court and these people have had 12 years with their uh, decimated seaweed farms and and a decimated environment and a, and a de dead I, fishery i take it it's still suffering it's is it? still it's it's just so criminal and a generation of kids have missed out on education because of the Australian government's failure to properly monitor the oil industry. And one particularly outrageous cowboy um, operator, and, and that's just not me saying that, it's a Royal Commission type uh, inquiry saying that by the Australian government, that this was an accident waiting to happen. 
This was the biggest offshore oil disaster in Australia's history. Peter Garrett was the Environment Minister at the time. He wrote a book about his time, not one word of Montara. It's, it's just the forgotten disaster. Australia has wiped its hands. But anyway, we, I, I digress. Um, so my next film uh, was Cry of the Forest, which was um, uh, a film I made in conjunction with the WA Forest Alliance, who were my impact partners. And that was um, meant to be a short film that grew to a feature film. And, and we did the same thing. We took it around cinemas. We had a really effective campaign and it helped um, uh, the movement grow and uh, led uh, event, which uh, led eventually to the government saying no to logging. Mm-hmm. So that showed me that people power can work and that mm-hmm. this sort of grassroots action of getting people in a cinema, talking to them, giving them a, a pathway, a road, map for action mm-hmm. we'll get to uh, that can on the really steps. do some ma- initiate change and social change from the ground up not the bot- the top up mm-hmm. mm. well I, I don't have any further questions I think you've answered quite a lot of them there oh well yeah. we'll go to a song and come up with more don't you worry <laughs> <laughs> uh, the cello suite number one in G major Oh, this one, yes. Interesting choice. Yeah, look, I, I tried learning this. I'm absolutely hopeless as a as a musician, but I did get a cello and started to try because I wanted to learn to play this piece, but uh, then filmmaking came, stepped in. It was about the same time. So I, right. I put my cello away and uh, <laughs> picked up my camera, but uh, Yo-Yo, and I'll leave it to Yo-Yo Ma. Oh, yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Cello Suite Number One in G Major. The Prelude. Yes, Yo Yo Ma. <laughs> Great. Nice tune. You wanted to cover a couple of things there, Jane. Uh, did you want to get onto that before James distracts us with what kind of camera equipment that you use because he's going to do it? I guarantee it. I'm but sure is there I don't a couple? Know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of other things around. Uh, you mentioned uh, pesticides earlier on. Yeah, look, there's quite a few things that you'll see in the film, um, quite a few issues that are impacting the birds. One of those is pesticides. There's a lot we don't know about how our carnivores are impacted. But we uh, we have anecdotal evidence and um, research by the scientists um, showing that there may be more than one impact and more than possibly one chemical uh, that is um, 
you know, devastating our carnabies. Um, and we look in the film at what happened in Moora last year where they lost uh, 70 chicks. And, you know, they seem that they, where there's a guy up there called Wally Kirkhoff who's been monitoring and looking after birds for a long, long time. And he watched as these sick birds uh, just, you know, would spasm and die. Um, and he put that down to pesticide poisoning. But as well... well it, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Well, yeah, we don't know what's causing this, but there's another thing that they're looking at called CHIPS, which is Carnaby's hind uh, limb paralysis syndrome, and that's when these birds just... Uh, it seems after they've feasted, feasted on what is most likely organophosphates, I think, but no one can quite point out what point in the cycle and, and what exactly the chemical is, um, but it looks like because of the symptoms that it's in that family of organophosphate phosphates um uh anyway these birds um lose the use of their legs and so they have to hang by their beak uh, from branches or just collapse on their bellies is and there, they end up dying is there a solution for that problem i mean farmers no. can't help but use organophosphates i presume i think yeah. we really need a review of of the pesticide use that we're doing mm -hmm. really and at to look at perhaps using a bit less perhaps using alternatives and also you know if we've got endangered species that are getting pesticide poisoning we've got you know is this australia's or western australia's silent spring you know i'm referencing that that book from the 60s where um, pesticides were killing the birds we really need to be looking carefully at what we're doing much more carefully and f putting so uh, the research into that and 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 responding appropriately yeah. not saying that this isn't a significant issue on its own but pesticides in birds suggest pesticides in the food that we're eating which is not good for us either so you know it's our own you know, saving our own skins as well to, a lot of these chemicals are quite thing. carcinogenic aren't they oh, i don't know yeah look there's a lot of chemicals that we're using willy-nilly that are banned in other places so i i think the Australian regulators need to forget about the fact that, oh, it's a big landscape, no probs, and look at what, you know, these are the canaries in the coal mine, these birds that are coming down with this, mm. this terrible, terrible affliction. And only a few of them are found, you know, so we don't know. How many um, are Yeah, affected? so we're looking, we don't know how many are affected because they take about six weeks to develop these symptoms and then goodness knows where they end up. Yeah. But they, they did have two mass poisonings in, in the, around the area of Karoo on two separate occasions several years ago. So that's when they started looking at what's causing this. Um, and that there are only the scientists are only monitoring certain sites, so we don't know what's happening at other sites. Did I read something about um, a flock of 200 birds dying for unknown reasons recently? Yeah, Does there's, quite, there's been a, quite a few mass deaths um, and in our carnabies a few years ago there was a 46 degree day down on the south coast and there just wasn't the water available and the birds can't fly when it's really hot so um, you know the the people who who have been looking after these birds and monitoring them had to have this terrible couple of days where they're just picking up bodies hundreds of bodies um, and if you wipe out on one in one day you know a substantial chunk of your population you're really in trouble so we've got to make sure that the population's big enough by not wiping them out on our roads by not wiping them out in the, and then you know the, the loss of the nangara pines and by saving all these little patches of remnant vegetation we've got to be doing so much more because climate change is coming and it's coming in a big and really impactful way and these creatures are suffering yes you were talking uh, while we were on off off air i beg your pardon about the uh, the way that the the, uh, the farmers are losing just small um bits of, seed on, the of road. seed on the road from the back of the trucks when stuff's being moved around uh why what ha actually happens to the birds then yeah, look, this is a problem that's happening, uh, particularly on our south coast. There's a road between the southwest highway between Albany and Wellard. Uh, is it, it, in May this uh, last year was an absolute killing field. They picked up 128 car dead carnabies that just had been smashed by cars, um, and they're on the roads. They're so hungry with so little vegetation. They're on the roads, picking out between the cracks in the bitumen tiny little black seeds of canola which are very yep, yep. tasty and addictive to these birds and then the car comes along and 
boom, they're gone. And I actually witnessed this. I went down to this road because I didn't know what was happening, but I'd, I heard a lot. I had a lot of reports. I was, you know, I crowdsourced a lot. Yep. I got information from everybody, and I was told several times, like, something's happening on this road. What's going on? There, it's a killing field. And so I went down there, and the, I just got into the area, and there, there was a flock of birds on the road. So I set up my camera. was about 30 metres back. I was still focusing. A four-wheel drive just came through and knocked out one of the female carnabies, a, a young bird. Um, and it was the most devastating thing to watch. Um, it was like watching my dog being run over. You know, I was just this blubbering mess and there was this dead bird and this snowflakes of feathers everywhere and screaming birds taking off in the, you know, because they, they're very um, attached to one another. So it was just the most devastating thing. And I thought, how can I can witness this in coming to this spot in five minutes how much of this is going on? And apparently 120 birds at a time. 120 in just one month, in just one piece of road and just what's discovered. And so we, everywhere we go, oh, everywhere there's grain haulage, this is happening. And so we can solve this by making sure, legislating to seal these trucks and to make sure that when they leave the depot or the farm, they're brushed off all those little seeds. Because every time they go around a corner or up a hill, they, they spread a few more. Yeah. And just... Uh, the week before last I was in Kokonarup with the Kokonarup people who were fighting to save that area from uh, from uh, lithium mining mm. and um, we were talking about grains and they said they showed me a mallee mound, a mallee fowl mound now these are so exciting to see one if you've ever seen one, they're so rare these birds um, and it was obvious that you know there was feathers and there were scratchings anyway the farmer um, who took me in there said we see mallee fowls but we mostly see them on the road and we mostly see them flattened and they're doing exactly the same they're getting the grain out of these areas out of the road and but the cars are just taking them out um, you know and I'm not advocating people to, to, to swerve or to, to slow down or you know put themselves at any risk but we need to stop the, this problem at its source we need to stop the grain going on the roads so you're, you're basically saying that the, the trucks and the farmers need to sheet over uh, when they're taking a, a truckload of grain to the, yeah, the storage, yeah, it's, it's a bit more than that. They're not. I, I'm not saying they're, they're, you know, they're 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 driving off with open trucks. They, as far as I can see, they're covered, but it's the little bit of leakage around the edges, all the seals on the trucks. So when you when you, when you fill your thing, there's little bits leaking out the side. Like you know, I mean, we saw just this week a freaking radioactive canister falling out of a truck. Yeah. I mean, you know, and that's not that much bigger than these seeds. So this is happening everywhere. I mean, I'm amazed that we even got to find out about that radioactive canister falling out. Yeah. How many of those are, are on our highway? It does make you wonder, doesn't it? Yeah. It's it's, it's just irresponsible. Mm. I think it's uh, absolutely time for this next song, which everyone will recognise. <laughs> Like lemon drops high above the gym. 
FM, the voice of your community. This is James, and we've got Kay across the desk, and okay, Jane, me. Yes, indeed. and the magnificent Seven. So, should we forge on? And I'm, I am going to talk about the damned cameras and, and the gear. <laughs> I should become a bit of a gearhead. For the, I for knew the night. that we couldn't stop you. We tried. <laughs> no, no, interesting stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, so talk to us. How? What's the technicalities of shooting a film? You said that earlier that, we, that you went to um, film school, took yourself back to school to learn how to make a film, basically. Yeah. Look. Um, I, I started off very minimalist, mm-hmm. like getting the cheapest and easiest, um, you know, bottom of the range cameras. Um, and I made uh, my first film with that and it actually won cinematography awards. So, Ooh. you know, and nobody could believe that I'm walking around with this um, handy cam. Anyway, um, I've since sort of um, gone a bit... Up, upwards up, a bit. Up, yeah, upgraded. Uh, somebody gave me a, another... Um, uh, cinematographer who liked my work but thought you can't be carrying that on with that camera <laughs> um, gave me a GH5 Lumix. Okay, yeah. Um, and so I learnt to, to use that, and it's a beautiful, beautiful camera. Um, and so for this film. So is that shooting um, 4K? Yeah, shooting 4K. Um, and for this film, I started with that, then I thought, no, no, I need a cine camera. So I, I long term hired a Canon C200. Okay, yeah. And then um, I, because everything I do is like a super budgety thing, um, because I, you know, like I have to scrape together every cent. Um, and I, I started buying second hand lenses for this rather than. Um, Rather than uh, hiring them, yeah, yeah, and and so I said, you know, but I wasn't getting real success, so I I went back to my Lumix and I hired a one to four hundred lens, and I just went boom, like the birds were just they came into view, I had beautiful focus. I just like oh my god, this is so good. Um, I end up having a. I, I ran after a flock of birds and I face planted, so I bent the lens. Oh, no. Uh, and, but it wasn't mine and I was too measly to insure it, so I, I, what I did was I fixed it and then I just bought it. It, it works beautifully, but it's bent, so it doesn't look <laughs> the greatest. But I, I don't care, it shoots well. So that became my favourite lens. But in between that, I also used two drones. I yep. used a little drone so I can get into areas that maybe under airports. I use a very small one that you're allowed to. I've, I've got my pilot's licence. I'm all legit. Um, and then I used a, a another DJI standard, um, about $2,000 drone. So, again, there'll be another 4K camera on that one. Oh, too. yeah, absolutely, yeah. all 4K. Um, and uh, and then I used two DJI pockets. Or in fact, no, I had four, but I kept burning them because they trip over all the time and... You know, I'm very clumsy, but uh, yeah, it does, it, yeah. When you're concentrating, and you're looking up. There's many things you can trip on. So I burned a few of them, uh, but they're great when you're close up because they're not. It's not like this big cameras are really in your face, but these little pockets shoot beautifully. They're gyroed, um, and I got uh, another piece of equipment that was made with um, a 4D printer. Um, so it gave me. It took out all my steps. So it's even more gyroed. So I use that quite a bit. Um, and so then, you're using something like a Ronin or something like yeah, that. Yeah, but I, d- I don't like Ronins because they're too. I've got a left right issue, so it takes too long to set up. So okay. this is like a jimbled head yep. of a small thing, like it's Osmo Pocket, DJI okay, Osmo yep. Pocket. Um, and then I used uh, GoPro, which I stuck to the side of the car for certain shots. 
um, I used uh, for night shots. I, I hired just on one off um, a Sony um, F. Uh, uh, FX3, I think it was. Um, yeah, FX3. Um, so all in all, I had about six to eight cameras. And then um, I wasn't getting the shot that I really wanted that I had in my head. Um, so I brought in another cinematographer to help me, uh, Richard Todd, who'd made Frackman and, and yes. had worked in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. was a great cinematographer and is just easy to work with work with because he's just and he probably had the gear delightful guy um yeah and he had and and what he showed me too is uh, like come on you got to get a good tripod here you know i was um, i was i'm a huge know. fan of using a tripod um, yeah I, like, I otherwise use one but not a good one yeah well uh, mine's half decent i think but um the, the point is it stops your camera from waving around in the wind mm. you know and if, it, if you hold the camera still then the imagery just looks better it look it's, it's like if you're looking out of a window rather than I get distracted by all the little movements on the side of the frame if it's being handheld. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Look, these cameras these days have really got good stabilisation, but you still should be on a tripod for this yeah, sort of work. Absolutely. And when you're on a long lens, you just can't hold it. No. So I, the C200 that I hired became too heavy for me mm -hmm. to traipse through the bush and point upwards, especially with a monopod. I was on a monopod and it was just, it wasn't working. So I went back to the Lumix, good. Um, a good but bottom of the range still um, tripod because some yep. of these tripods cost more than the camera. Can do. And yeah, so I, I, I again, I got a second hand one, hired it, liked it, bought it. Um, so um, yeah, and then I did uh, some studio work, but I, I hired a another cinematographer to, who specialised in that sort of you know high end advertising type, mm -hmm. um, and he did with a bird trainer in Sydney that had they had a sanctuary that had our um, species. Um, uh, um, they did the the studio section, which is my opener, where you okay. see birds yeah. in black um, on a black background, so they're beautifully lit, and and uh, yeah, uh, we get these close ups, and you're really engaging with the birds from the get go. So yeah, it was it was a fantastic journey, and I and um, I, when I got a bit more money, I employed a a wonderful soundie in Lucy mm -hmm. Nickel. Um, who is a, is a local uh, graduate also of the Screen yep. Academy yep, yep. and another environmental filmmaker. Um, so, um, yeah, I had all the technical support then um, and uh, could, could really take off, but it was very much a learning yep. journey. Yeah, so did you find yourself standing out in, in the fields with the mic on a, on a pole and stuff, doing that stuff? Lots. Yeah, when when Lucy came, so yeah, definitely we we had all sorts of weird contraptions um, in in the middle of nowhere. Um, but before that, when I just used an onboard mic, when I you know because you can't really lapel up the cockatoos. As no, much they as probably like totally to. wouldn't like that. No. <laughs> but but if there's no wind, it's quite a good you know you can get when I'm working solo. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the weight issue was a a problem. You know, just like I t started to really tire you know four hours filming and i'd need to sleep the cameras would get so heavy <laughs> so yeah back back with the lumex and it was much more manageable so that's basically what you're working with now i guess yeah just yeah. sticking with the lumex well a range so when i do the night shots then i will go and hire another sony um fx mm -hmm. um when i'm talking uh when i'm on the move then the pocket osmos when yep. i'm in the air obviously the dji drones yep. um and then, yeah, the, I gave the Canon back. I just okay. thought, no, it's a beautiful camera. I, I love cine cameras more than the DSLR style, mm -hmm. um, but they're just too heavy. And, and you know, whilst I'm, you know, not small, I'm not strong. So, um, yeah, carting around. I've, I want to be able to climb a mountain with whatever gear I have. So that's yeah. my test. Oh, I, I was just thinking it. then it sounds very, very indulgent to have um, a camera for every day, basically. So you, you've got your, your Lumix there and you've got your Canon and you've got your, your GoPros and you've got your DJIs on the on the drones. And, and it seems almost like a, a camera for every shot. Yep. And it, it seems a little bit self-indulgent, a little bit indulgent, beg your pardon, but it's it's not actually that different to a um, a, a tradesman having a box full of spanners when you know the 10 mil is clearly not going to work for a 20 mil nut. Mm. Um, and, and it's that sort of issue, isn't it, that you're, you're dealing with? Yeah, you really want to have a different, like something that shoots in low light, something that shoots from the air, so and something that shoots on the move. Yep. You, and so you have in your kit as many different but 
carryable cameras yeah. as you can. Um, uh, yeah, but it, it was getting out of control, the amount of gear. You know, if I took anyone else in the car, it's like, mm, you the, can't bring... They're in the ashtray tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't bring much stuff. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I think when, I, when I'm going out um, doing any shooting, I've got my trunk full of gear. Um, that's without any backdrops which have to go on the roof rack usually or something like that. Um, it can get a bit silly, can't it? I'm going to take this moment while you guys are taking a breath <laughs> and uh, pay some of our bills and then go to a song. Oh, right then. In Serpentine, Jarradale, Gosnells, Armadale and Cannington, we're the voice of your community. 107.3 HFM. Why pay new prices when you can give something previously loved a new life, save money and help save the planet? At Second Chance Op Shop in Kelmscott, we have an amazing selection of books, clothing and homewares, all great quality and at low, low prices. So why not refresh your library, wardrobe and give your home some finishing touches by visiting our shop on 255 Railway Avenue, Kelmscott. Second Chance Op Shop. Find us on Facebook and come and have a browse. Station sponsor... Station sponsor Reed's Remotes are a family owned and run business. They offer a one stop shop to most remotes and keys. Stocking WA's largest range of replacement garage and gate remotes and batteries to fit all makes and models. Replacement keys from spare keys to house keys, flip keys and smart proximity keys. They are fully licensed to cut and program spare car keys. Located east of Cuck, you can find them online or in store. Head to reedsremotes.com.au. Station sponsor. MRB 8165. 107.3 HFM, the voice of your community, is proudly supported by Reed's Remotes, Rockingham Beach Fish and Chips, Earth Mobile Nursery. Become a corporate member and support the voice of your community. Go to the webpage heritagefm.org for email details or to find out more. In Huntingdale, Wongong at Oldbury, we're the voice of your community. 107.3 HFM.
another excellent piece of music the main title theme to Billy by Bob Dylan a uh, great piece of music got some excellence got some crackers in there Jane that's fantastic it's, it's been very nice hasn't it yeah oh, I, I actually really like um, the, the, the way that the music for this particular show works out because we don't actually choose it most often as not or more often than not and our guests all have a very different taste so we have you doing this um, uh, what would we call it Hev- heavily WA influence, but also with a cl- classical bent. Uh, it was a bit funny, actually, because Jane actually gave me the first seven songs, but not all of them at the beginning, and I just whacked in some of my own choices, and I got this lovely email back saying, here's the other ones, you can replace yours now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, I agonised and agonised. I was like, oh, I like so much music. But, um, yeah, my my children have always said I've got very eclectic tastes. In yes. fact, weird tastes, Mum. Well, 107.3 HFM, the voice of your community, we're right behind you. Yeah. <laughs> well, what do we refer to it recently? Uh, we like playing the beast sides of music yes that's that's fantastic as well okay so big question where do we get to see this air film yeah young jane yeah this film called black cockatoo crisis yeah look it's been showing in cinemas since november we had a really good run at the lunar and currently uh we've been taking it on region an original tour we've just come back from margaret river next week i go to the east coast i've got a national tour sydney melbourne adelaide brisbane wow um but congratulations by the way yeah yeah look it's fantastic it's going really well and um the next chance to see it in perth is actually at the wa made film festival Mm. Uh, that's on Sunday, February the 19th at 10 o'clock at Palace Cinemas in Rain Square. But you need to jump online to grab tickets because they're selling out to these all these screenings mm-hmm. really quickly. Um, WO uh, made Film Fest was very popular. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, well supported by the community. Um, and after that, we've got a, another series of, um, of regional... Uh, screenings. I was going to say, I think you mentioned Waruna, didn't you, there? Yeah, I mean, we got that's, that's not far away. You can do that in an hour if you drive like James does. Right. <laughs> I drive very sensibly and just about within the speed limit. <laughs> yeah, we're having this beautiful screening at Waruna at Drakesbrook Winery, which is near Waruna oh, Dam. That wow. civilised. And it's, yeah, so it was look across the water. Um, it, it'd be a be- It's a beautiful setting because I actually went there and I filmed there because they released a number of red-tailed black cockatoos there. So it's quite a... Mm. So we're likely to come and see the cockatoos come in. Hmm. Great. Okay. Like they, they, they roost there, do they? Yeah. They screened oh, wow. in Mundaring recently and the cockatoos came in. As I arrived, they came in. Um, so And they're pretty... I'd, like, I'd want to go and watch their faces as the screen... Uh, you know, like you're going to be playing sounds of cockatoos that aren't from their area. You know they're going to cock their heads and go, what is that and what are they saying? Yeah, do, do they respond to the film being performed? Well, I think by that stage they've well and truly moved on or gone. They just oh, okay. they were just bringing their... Like, they, they are the spirit <laughs> birds. And look, whenever I was feeling down about things, I was like, it's too overwhelming, I'd get a visit. And I know that sounds kooky, but I, I do believe they are the messenger birds. They really... There's some connection there. You know, they... Mm, uh, fascinating. At my last film, Cry of the Forest, we were um, filming this scene and it was in the forest. Um, we had a couple of people locked on to machinery and one up a tree and the police came and they were saying to this guy up in the tree, uh, you know, get down now or we're going to charge you $10,000 for stopping work at this logging site. And in came the carnabies, like this massive flock just came in as these threats were being made against the pro- protester. It just filled the sky with this ra- raucous squawking and it was spine tingling and even the cops are sort of looking up and the, the loggers are looking up and people are pointing and one of the protesters says, and I, ca- I caught it on film, and she said, oh, the carnabies are coming in. And um, I spoke to Kelton Pell, who was the narrator, who's a a wonderful actress, uh, actor, um, and a a local West Australian. His country is is part of that area, Wadandi. Mm -hmm. And he said, I said, they felt like they knew. And he said, of course they knew. They're our ancestors. They know these things. So I I thought, yeah, I mean, 40,000 years, um, people have been been watching this, integrating with, with nature. And these birds have been part of the landscape. So, uh, yeah, they're, there's something going on there. Just Amazing. another reason to protect them and, yeah, not destroy ourselves in the process. Fascinating. Mm. So, uh, the regional tour was... I jumped in there with Warina, but was there more regional tour options? Yeah, we're in Moora um, on March the 18th. And our Moora's are 
uh, incredible town. We see it in the film. It's it's Carnaby Central. They had the poisonings there, but they also have had they've done a lot of work to bring Carnies back into that area. And right at the end of the film, you see, you know, the new chicks in Moora in in these hollows that have been made to replace the dwindling hollows because of all the clearing. So they've put man-made hollows and the, and the birds love them. Yeah, you know, they're oh, setting up that's good news. setting up homes. So um, Mora are raising hundreds of thousands of dollars. They've they've nearly made it. That's like three hundred and thirty thousand dollars to build the world's biggest carnaby statue in the town. They've got like the, you know you've got the big pineapple, the big kangaroo, whatever. Uh, and they're going to have the big carnaby, um, and that's going to be a great tourist attraction. I think people are going to want to go raise and raise awareness, get their yes. Insta shots, yeah, yeah and okay. uh, raise awareness. And you go to Mora, and they've got this like amazing bistro. You could be in Paris, and uh, you would never <laughs> expect to see. Uh, you know, you get a great meal, great coffee, great drive. It's a new bin dune, so uh, that'll be exciting. Mm-hmm. We're in dwelling up on March the third, Bridgetown on the twenty fifth of February. Yeah, Waruna, 24th of February. We're also, um, um, you know, there's Bustleton and Bunbury and more Margaret River, more Denmark screenings So if people up. missed writing all that down, where can they get that information from? A blackcockatoocrisis.com.au. I've got a website and I, I, I'm battling, but I, I try to update with all the screenings as they come to hand. Mm-hmm. So um, at the moment we're promoing mostly the national tour. So Sydney next Saturday. Okay, that actually leads me very inelegantly into a uh, community service announcement I wanted to mention, and I'm organising your schedule for you, James. Um, is social media your side hustle? Is mine. Yeah, well, yeah, that's something that's important to all of us, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I can't actually make this um, activity. This is on the Saturday 4th of February, but the city of... Armadale is organising to have an expert, Amanda Kendall, a social media lecturer from Murdoch University, come and answer questions and help people to organise their social media. So you will already know that using social media to promote your work is one of the best tools at your disposal if you have a side hustle or starting your own business or, like all of us here, have something existing. It's cheap and it can be free apart from the time involved and you can really allow your audience to get to know you and your work well. The problem is there are so many options and it can be time consuming to figure out the best strategy. So this is why uh, Murdoch University's Amanda Kendall is going to come and help Saturday the 4th of February from 1pm till 230 so unfortunately you're going to miss my Making IT Easy show because you're going to be there. Um, it's for adults, it's free and you just need to book online so go to uh, armadale.wa.gov.au find social media for your side hustle and book your spot. Yes, oh and we're going to pay some more bills and then we'll Talk more, more stuff. about the next steps for the uh, black cockatoos and the carnabies. 107.3 HFM, the voice of your community, is proudly supported by Chris Tallentire, MLA member for Thornley. Upstream Aviation. Become a corporate member and support the voice of your community. Go to the webpage heritagefm.org for email details or to find out more. In Beckenham, Forestdale and Byford. We're the voice of your community. 107.3 HFM. Do you like your music hard and heavy or punchy and melodic? How about music with a real attitude? If so, Rock Aria can lift your spirit, turn it on its head, roll it up in a ball and toss it in the air. Latest releases and classics from here and around the world. Interviews covering the local scene and special events. Even artists live in the studio. Two hours of the latest and greatest tunes. Rock Aria, Saturdays from 3. Rock Aria, Rock and Roll Overload. Hi, Dave Faulkner here from the Hoodoo Gurus, and you're tuned to 107.3 HFM, the voice of your community. Back with James and Kay and Jane Hammond on The Magnificent Sevens. Uh, what is it? Magnificent Seven. It's just on The Magnificent, magnificent Seven. It wasn't seven, Magnificent Seven anything. Magnificent. It's just Magnificent Seven. It is Magnificent. HFM. There we go. HFM. HFM. 107.3. And what is it? <laughs> it is the voice of your community. It is indeed. Well done, James. Um, so we were going over with uh, young Jane here, who's um, still managing to uh, cling on despite our being a little bit... 
cray cray. A little bit cray cray tonight. <laughs> I'm not I'm not managing it's to English very well. It's the first one back. It's the first one back. Jane was actually asking before, do we do this every week? No, we don't. No, we are occasional co-hosts of the Magnificent Seven. The Magnificent Seven has uh, seven-ish members that cover <laughs> all the different parts of the arts and we co-host sometimes. So uh, this is ours and this is our first one back. But I also uh, co-host every week uh, Making IT Easy. Between 12 and 2, bring your lunch and your smart device. And my uh, very smart other half uh, talks particularly focused towards seniors, but to anyone who wants to know more about their smart device, how to use it. And he's yeah. brilliant. Uh, and it's you really know, good. Yeah, you'll talk about something like changing the screen brightness and he'll go through each different device and how it all works and how you have to swipe down for this one and move up to that one. Yeah, he's very clever. So that's good fun. And we play music from the 50s through to the 70s at the same time, starting with Elvis always. Excellent. Anyway... That's enough about me. Um, <laughs> we want to talk, uh, ask you, actually, we'll come back to next steps. Let's ask you about dinner first, because as part of the Magnificent Seven, our standard question for all of our guests is if you could invite eight guests to dinner, alive or dead, and this is not including your family, because we're going to assume that you're going to bring them anyway, whether we tell you you can or not, um, who would you bring and why? And if you feel like it, who would you sit with who? Right, well... My first, this was the first one. First on the guest list was very easy, and that was David Attenborough. <laughs> oh, yes, okay. Because That's... he's just so cool, he's so active, and he's so wonderful, and I'd love to meet him. Mm -hmm. The nec next, I thought Jane Goodall. I was going to say, if yeah, you're going to yeah. invite David Attenborough, yeah, Jane Goodall. I've met Jane. Right. Lovely. Yeah, yeah, it's because I've been reading her book about hope. So I, I like what David Attenborough particularly at the moment is saying about climate change mm. and what he has been saying and same with Jane Goodall about uh, hope and so to uh, round that up I would um, get Greta Thunberg but she'd have to zoom in because she wouldn't fly right so okay. that would be okay and with um, Desmond Tutu because you know we need a sort of a voice around this table more I guess spiritual and also human rights orientated wow. so very much biodiversity protection and climate change but also bringing in that context of human rights and then um, I, I you know I wouldn't want to just chew the fat with these guys I'd want to get something out of it long term <laughs> so with this with these great minds around the table I'd I'd get Sarah Ferguson um, not Fergie the Royal, but the journalist. Right. Because uh, she, she would be taking notes and, and report on this momentous meet, meeting because also around the table would be our Prime Minister, Albany, uh, uh, Anthony Albanese, mm -hmm. um, our Environment Minister, Tanya Plebisek, and our local um, Premier, Mark McGowan. And I would hope that as an outcome of the meeting of these great minds, wow. uh, that they could... Pres persuade our political leaders to end gas and, and coal in, a, in Australia and transition super quickly out of these, you know, dreadful things to um, a better, um, a more ecologically a more sustainable, sustainable outcome. Yeah. Do, do you think, just, I'll, I'll try and keep this briefly, brief, do you think that there is a momentum um, going towards that outcome in Australia? Um, yeah, look, definitely there is a change in the air and I think that's very strong, but I think we have uh, too much political, you know, our, 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 you know, fossil fuel industry is, is pulling the strings um, and, and paying, paying too much to our political masters. Well, I think that's true, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so yes and no. But, you know, a meeting like this, I um, mean, uh, you know, it'd be great to get on film. It's... Uh, It would be an amazing thing it to would. film. It would. Was that your eight? Yes, we covered oh, all I of our eight. I think that's eight, yeah. yes. Okay, excellent. We're going to go to our second last song of the evening, which is Sing For You by Tracy Chapman. Hooray. From, yeah. Okay, that was more enthusiasm than you usually provide. No. <laughs> <laughs> is there a particular reason for this song, Jane, or just one oh, of your favourites? Again, I just loved it. And, and it, to me, it's about uh, being a parent. You know, so I thought that was um, a being a parent and a child. So I thought mm. that was, um, you know, I don't know. It resonated with me, and I and I loved Tracy Chapman. Yeah, and early stuff especially. One, here two, we go. One, when she's counted two, in. Three.
you can hum along to I remember there was a time When I used to sing for you to 107.3 HFM, the voice of your community. This is James, that's Kay, and young Jane is sitting to my left. And how Indeed. are we doing? We're good. As promised, we want to talk about the next step. So if people have been listening to this, like we have, and just talking about being uninformed and trying to become more informed, the question is, what can we actually do? Is there anything we can do as individuals? And you're going to tell me there are. Absolutely. You know, the, the film has a social, a wraparound social impact campaign attached to it. Mm-hmm. So after most of the screenings, not the, the seasonal ones when we had the long run at the, the Lunar, but the premiere and all the special events and all the regional ones and the Eastern States ones, I go in a, a talk and usually uh, we're alongside um, campaigners from, from the Wilderness Society and the Save the Black Cockatoo Coalition, which is part of the WA Forest Alliance. And so we, we talk about what you can do. And the strongest thing that people can do is go and engage with their local member of parliament and let them know that this is an area of concern. Um, and the idea is that we get people from Albany to Kalbarri to Esperance to Morley all talking to their politicians and the politicians coming together and going, what is going on? Everyone's talking about those bloody cockatoos. <laughs> and so that that's the aim, mm-hmm. to really get that, um, to, to make enough noise to make this an issue, to make it uh, impossible to ignore. So um, some of the things that we want the government to do include... Um, 
uh, sealing the grain trucks, saving the Nangara pines, putting an immediate halt on those, uh, you know, doing something about the ever expansion of mining in cockatoo habitat. And we're looking at two things there. One is bauxite mining, and they want to mine even more. Um, we're already uh, red tail. Uh, forest red tailed black cockatoos are in trouble in the northern Jarrah forest. The northern Jarrah forest itself, we've been warned by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is under severe threat um, of ecological collapse because of climate change. And if we don't stop mismanaging it in the way that we have been, we could see the absolute collapse of that ecosystem and the dire consequences for life in Perth as a result and uh, habitat. So we had a partial collapse in about 2011 of, of parts of the Jarrah Forest, um, uh, something to do with the El Nino effect. So we know that it can happen. So, um, so we're really right on the cusp of significant climate crisis, aren't oh, we? Oh, absolutely. And the, and the birds um, and the other animals are, you know... Really struggling. Uh, yeah, really struggling. And we have, you know, these ma really hot days and we're all thinking, oh, God, I wish I had my air conditioning. Um, that birds don't have that choice. And if we don't have enough... If there isn't enough water in the landscape for them, they just die. And, and um, so, you know... I mean, I was in Cairns when they had the biggest heat wave and uh, bats were dropping out of the... I heard about that. Yeah, That's out of the... remarkable out of the um, trees and dying and it, you know like we were walking to the shops and our thongs were melting on the pavement that's how hot it was so you know this is the future in australia and so we all have to be doing what we can to make the environment more resilient so we ca we can't afford to be chopping down our forests to to um, give you know, companies like south 32 and alcoa more and more and more of our precious forest for bauxite to make into alumina, we we just it's a crazy thing to do. This you don't you don't need to chop down the only Jarrah forest on the planet for a quite common mineral. Mm. So I've got, I've got your list here of things to do. One is to fill and return the black cockatoo crisis postcard that you pick up at, at screenings. At screenings, yep. excellent. To write, phone, or best of all, visit your local MP and ask them to take real and urgent action to save the black cockatoos. Donate to the film social impact outreach campaign. Absolutely. Um, to plant a native tree, shrub or nut tree in your garden and join the movement to rewild, restore and replant our suburbs, regions, towns and cities. And I suspect put pressure on local governments to actually do more of that as well. That was me, not the sheet. Um, and join the Wilderness Society and the WA Forest Alliance and become part of the solution. So that's blackcockatoocrisis.com.au. Excellent. Um, thank you so very much, Jane, for joining us. It's been an absolute, absolute pleasure and eye-opener that uh, we've found out more about the bloke cockatoos and some of the show has been terribly, terribly sad, which is absolutely appropriate because it's a crisis out there, as you say, and we need to be doing more. Um, just quickly, Magnificent Seven um, next week. Tune in between 7 and 9 and the week after it's going to be about hip-hop. It think. is. Yes, yes, we have Young William on with Ron and Ron Arthurs, so they are both scheduled to be presenting the week after. On this is Valentine's Day, I believe, yes. And they are going to be talking about hip-hop. Excellent. That's all the young people are doing these days. <laughs> that's it. So and uh, don't forget Making IT Easy, we mentioned earlier. That's on Saturday at 12. We're going to be talking about how to check your remaining data, how microbots can help clean your teeth, watching movies online, how and how that is affected by copyright, and the app of the day is going to be Netflix. So join me then. In the meantime, thank you very much, Jane. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, James. My pleasure as it's well. It's been fantastic. Thank you for running the yeah. desk. Oh, you're very welcome. And we're going out with John Butler's Ocean for all of it while I get myself into gear before the next uh, next music starts. Thank you both. See you next time. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. tuned to 107.3 HFM. Awesome.